The Edifice Complex podcast is brought to you by DCM, the drawing specialists, Blue Rhythm Commissioning Software, and Sensor Suite, the future of intelligent buildings. Welcome to the Edifice Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts, Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean, keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work, perspective on the adjacent possible, and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I am Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator here with my colleague, official agitator as always, friend and Yoda of most everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, sir, Yoda. Hello, Yoda. So I am interested in this conversation today, the green building movement. In my last blog, I'm a fan of the Green Building Movement. Don't get me wrong, but in my last blog, I came out as hating that name, Green Building Movement. So we'll talk about that as well. Because I think it's uh, one of the reasons it doesn't go far. It's got the wrong name. Anyway, let's, let's get into it. Yeah, so today's guest uh, earned his mechanical engineering uh, degree from McGill University and then went on to earn his master's from Columbia University. Uh, with those under his belt, he ended up doing research and development for a small little company called Carrier Corporation. And... Uh, Followed by 31 years with uh, Tatum Engineering, where he resides today as uh, chairman of the board. Uh, welcome to the show, Ian Shapiro. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, Adam. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Ian, um, in addition to your broad experience in engineering and building and, uh, and building systems, uh, which includes energy and indoor environmental quality, uh, you have two publications under your belt, uh, one where you're the uh, solo author, Energy Audits and Improvements for Commercial Buildings, but you're also a co-author of Green Building Illustrated, uh, who you wrote that book with, with uh, Francis D. Cheng, who's very famous in the world of architectural publications. I just want to show you your most current version of that book, by the way. Um, both Adam and I give it two thumbs up, and we're glad to feature it here today. Uh, on the podcast, but I want to show you it came from my library, which was from 1975 by the same author, Francis D. Ching, and this book has sat in my library since graduating out of school. Um, prior, just for our, our audience, uh, Ian offered me a hundred bucks for the book. I told him I wouldn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> I How I ended up with the book, is I paid a library fine. It was 18 bucks. <laughs> you can't have it. It's, it's, it's one of my collectibles. Probably one of the most quintessential influential books on architectural illustrations ever written. And for you to have him as a co-author and be part of that journey, you know, kudos on you. If I could rewrite my career and I could include an author, he would be one of them. Uh, so how you did that was, was amazing. Anyways, People want to know, how'd you, how did you transition? Well, you didn't really transition because you're still part of the engineering world, but engineering to authorship, what, what drove that? Oh, my God, I don't know. My, it was, I went to make you, you know, there's a little part of me that's uh, still Canadian. Um, <laughs> I, well, no, you know what I love to do? I, I love to come up to Canada to buy flake bars, to buy <laughs> chocolate bars. <laughs> because they, they, there's some, I think Hershey has some sort of a thing with Cadbury. Cadbury, they cannot sell it in the U.S. Uh, so I come up, I cross the border, you know, Thousand Islands, I go to Kingston to buy flake bars. So, <laughs> um, but I don't know, my journey they, in, 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 at McGill, they called me a closet English major. I'm just co I'm comfortable with words. Now you guys have found yourselves, you've come out of construction into the, into the world of words. And I think it's important for us just to be able to communicate. And you guys have done it. And, and I, I don't know quite how it came about. I, I started writing, oh, I, I was asked to, I, somebody was ill at Cornell University in the Department of Architecture or he left on short notice or something. So they were looking around desperately to find somebody to teach environmental control. And they got my name and I, so I went and I taught this third year class. And then coming out of that, um, this is already almost 20 years ago, 
but LEED had been founded. And I had my own ideas about green buildings. You know, I had started my company. The acronym for Tatum is technology as if the earth mattered. So uh, I, I had always been interested in the environment, going back to the energy crises and the whole renewable, uh, the renewable energy movement. I had always been interested in energy. So I came out of this class at Cornell and I, I started writing. I wrote uh, two or three articles for ASHRAE Journal. And, um, and though they were well received and I heard from ASHRAE that they were using my articles in their certification programs. You know, so that gave me a bit of a boost. And um, one thing led to another. I had been doing some other teaching so I had this idea. So should I should I jump right in with how I met Frank sure. Chang? Yeah, that's your story. So about you know I don't want to say how many years ago, but I went to McGill, and there's this wonderful used bookstore in Mo downtown Montreal in the student ghetto. It's on Milton Street. It's called The Word, and it's tiny. It's all used books, and I think in that bookstore, I found a book of his, which was his first book. This is decades ago. And the book's called Architectural Graphics. And I, and I love drawing, I love graphics. So I picked up the book and I taught myself how to sketch from this book. So fast forward, you know, a bunch of years. And I have the idea to write a green building book. And somebody says to me, you know, it's got to be illustrated. So, so I'm sitting at home on a weekend, I don't know, 10 years ago. I say to myself, well, if it's going to be illustrated, what kind of illustration? You know, I really like those illustrations by Frank Ching. Yeah. His first book, his name is Frank. It's not Francis D.K. Ching. And I wonder if he's still alive. So I Google him. And he has just retired from University of Washington from teaching. I, I find his email. It's a Saturday evening. I send him an email. I say, uh, Mr. Ching, I'm a fan of your work. I'm thinking of writing a book on green buildings. Would you have any interest to illustrate it? He writes back one line. Um, Hi, Mr. Shapiro. My editor has been bugging me to do a book on green buildings. I'd be happy to. That was it. And he's, he's just a delightful, delightful guy. He has won awards for collaboration because he used to write his own books. And then at a certain point, he decided he's going to stick with illus illustrating. And so his book, uh, Structures, he has one on interior design. He has one on history. And he lets other people write the text. So anyway, that's the long, short version of how I came to meet uh, Wow. Well, if you don't ask, you don't get it, right? You know, I don't know. It's some, some arrogance on my part or something. But he, he's a delightful fellow. Just, oh, what a delight. And, and very modest. Um, you know, well, there's a lesson there immediately for our listeners. <clears throat> you don't get anything if you don't ask. The worst thing that could have happened to you there was he said, look, I'm retired. I'm sorry, I can't do it. But you got a great result, right? And it's a, it's almost a life-altering result. You know, it takes you on a trajectory. It helps you produce something. And the power of that was you just sent an email. That's what it cost, right? I, I, have, a, I have a brother who runs a construction management company down in New Jersey. Right. A great, great little company. And he says, when they write proposals, they get a, and he says, when they write a big proposal, they're going to build a school for $100 million. He says, what's the worst that can happen? We'll get the project. You know? <laughs> exactly. That's a contractor's perspective, that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. So um, out of school, you end up working for Carrier. You know, it was... Um, it was 1980s, I came out of grad school and there was a recession. And I sent out maybe 300 letters and I got one request for an interview. I mean, it was, it was 
you know, those recessions in the 80s and 90s were brutal. I got one request for an interview and, um, and I had in grad school, I had taken a course in refrigeration and air conditioning, which was, I, I don't know why I took it, but they saw that on my resume and that was unusual for them. And so I got an offer to design heat pumps at their headquarters in Syracuse. And that's what I did for, you know, uh, se seven years. I was designing heat pumps and then window air conditioners and then doing research on com combustion back in those days before combustion got a bad name. I um, was working on boiler design. Um, so that's the only real job I've ever had, you know, since then I, I started a company, right? But that was the only like, that's the only job on my resume is working for, for Carrier. Actually, I just want to give Carrier a shout out. So I am also a product of the early 80s recession. And in the 80s, there, when VAV started to come on in buildings, Carrier did a project called, Mod, a product called Moduline. Do you remember Moduline? So yeah. it was self-aspirated, no control wiring. Yeah. It was all sort of um, self-aspirating controls. It was really innovative, right? Yeah. And it was a cheap, in my opinion, to this day, it's still the cheapest way to do VAV, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it, it was great. I, I, I don't know. I've still got the Moduline carrier handbook on my website because now and again, you come across an old job. And it's got moduline units, and because I'm the old dude, I'm the only one who knows what they are and how to fix them and how to do them. Well, they had to differentiate. So yeah. they, they were VAV boxes. They had the moduline, and then they had the fan-powered yeah. VAV yeah. boxes because they had to differentiate it from the moduline was very successful. Oh. And they, they had a nice trimmer line, um, you, you know, um, they, they, they were selling chillers in, in uh, Syracuse. They had an enormous factory. I mean, yeah. because they were selling chillers to Saudi Arabia. Yep. They built a chiller that is used to this day to air condition the outdoors in Mecca. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, because people were dying during the, um, during the Hajj. pilgrimage. And so they've, they've got a chiller that just blows cold air into this square yep. to keep, keep people alive. You know? So I just, I, I worked in Saudi in, nine, in the 80s and I worked on a project called King Khalid Military City. It is literally a city in the middle of nowhere. Wow. As a district cooling plant, it has the biggest carrier chillers I've ever seen in my life. The pipe work in and out of each chiller is a metre in diameter. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And they are just row upon row of these suckers. I just don't even know how that factory did that order. I mean, it must have been gargantuan. Well, this this uh, this factory, it's no longer there. But it was, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, it was it was so big. You stepped into it. I don't. I, it almost felt like I was stepping into like nineteenth century Manchester or something. Yeah, yeah, like Isabel like, Kingdom Brunel, right? <laughs> well, this, this factory had its own environment, you know? I mean, it was um, huge. And in those days, they were using a lot of trichloroethylene to yeah. degrease heat exchangers. I mean, it was pretty, it was big and it was pretty toxic. Um, but um, it was also a great place to work. I, I, left, on, I left on good terms. I kept friends there. Um, carriers changed over the years. It's no longer the number one um, air conditioning company in the world. I think Daikin is now number one. Daikin, I think, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I, I learned a lot there. So that's an that's a interesting contrast to sort of what's going on now. So, you know, when the 80s, you got carrier, you know, the big, the big manufacturing plant. And now we're talking, particularly with in relation to your book, green building, trying to do the same with less to minimize, to simplify, you know, to talk about the envelope. It's almost a complete 180, right? <laughs> From where the carrier was. Um, yeah. Well, you know, uh, Rick Fidrizi, who's one of the founders of Lee of USGBC and LEED, uh, was, was a marketing manager at Carrier 
right. with me in the 1980s. And so I think Carrier has always had a kind of commercial interest right. in green buildings. Um, and I, I think Rick had some branding experience that helped him and that helped lead, I think. Um, but I was, I, I was always interested in green. I was mainly interested in energy. Um, and, and, and I've come back to that. I, I, um, I think green was, a, um, I'll tell you a secret. The original title of the book didn't have the word green in it. What, um, so what was the original title? It was called Layers of Shelter. Oh. Layers of shelter. Don't I tell me. I can anyone. see why your editor didn't go with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, you can see why they, uh, well, he wanted, they, wa they wanted something that would fit on the shelf. With, like, yeah. James, all of Frank's books have the word illustrated. So, yeah. Um, but my, my underlying, ex my underlying, you know, my underlying experience is more energy. It's mostly yeah. energy. Which, which I think is the cornerstone of green buildings, but green buildings do have an interest in water and they do have an interest in the site and they do have an interest in the soil and they do have, you know, they broadened it, indoor, indoor environmental quality, and that's good. I, I support all of those things. And we've circled back, in my mind, with, with climate change and reducing emissions, we've circled back to energy again, I think. Um, you know, so it's interesting because, um, you know, I do a lecture for ASHRAE on, and the title, the title is prov provocative. It's about indoor environmental quality or energy, what should be driving the bus. And one of the statements uh, that a couple of colleagues of mine uh, made, which I've held on to, uh, was that energy efficiency and energy conservation should be a byproduct of achieving the indoor environment, the desired indoor environment. And I, and I always thought that that message, it certainly resonated with me. You know, I mean, all of us are, pra are practicing engineers, are retired practicing engineers. Energy, of course, is a big part of it. But I always had issues that whenever we design systems based exclusively on energy, that we ultimately end up having indoor environmental quality problems one way or another. Most of them architecturally the result of bad architecture. And... Uh, but then when we started to look at human physiology and psychology within the space, we started studying all of Fanger's work and then also the medical textbooks, that all of a sudden we realized that the missing equation between good buildings and bad buildings was the occupant and their way that they sensed the indoor environment. And so when these colleagues of mine came up with that statement that efficiency and conservation should be a byproduct of achieving the desired indoor environmental quality, boom, it hit me. You know, that was, that seemed to me, well, yeah. I, you know, I think ultimately we're, we're human beings. We spend a significant amount of time indoors and we need to be comfortable. We need to be comfortable for, um, for our health, for our well-being, for our productivity. Yes. And so that there are some underlying um, threshold goals and those goals do conflict with energy use i mean you know if we all if we all sat still and didn't breathe we'd <laughs> use less energy but we we cannot do that I, 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 I just want to know if adam had anybody working for him that was like that <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but then, I, go sorry, ahead adam i'm just wondering like, energy uh, I, I'm sort of with Robert on this. Energy is just one component of the whole pie. But for me, energy is an output. Energy use is an output of a design, right? Bad design, bad construction you know, equals more energy, right? So how you design a building dictates the energy footprint, right? Yeah, totally. Amongst other things, right? So for me, energy is an output component. Right? You can design with it in mind, but really the game, if you want, the game of green building or high-performance building is to create a low-energy footprint, right? 
or a low environmental footprint. The thing with the, this is where green building, I think the name green building needs to be rethought because when you say green building, in my mind, I go, how is it green? Right? Is it green because it's low energy? Is it green because it's got low environmental energy footprint? Is it green because it's got a certificate on the wall? Right? So I think the public have moved, they've accepted the phenomenon of green building. It needs to be refined with some real definition. Yeah. So it's green if it does this, it's green if it does that. Well, and, and I, I, I like high performance. Yeah. I like, you know, um, for me, one of the keys between the first edition of, of our book in 2014 and the second is I think what's happening, the, the green building movement was, was kind of invented as an elective thing, yeah. right? It was like, um, this is how you can differentiate yourself because, and in some ways it was, it was invented as a luxury, as a, as a, um, totally hundred percent. And, and what's happening is that there's a shakeout, I think happening now where we are deciding what green elements are no longer elective, but are mandatory. Yeah. And they're they're getting codified in the in the energy code, and um, uh, not only the energy code, also the plumbing code, and 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 I recognize that the U.S. has different codes than in Canada, but many of these things are being um, found to be non-elective. With COVID, now suddenly, mm. indoor environmental quality comes to the well. Should we have buildings that are that are um, that, that deal with COVID that some people get and other people don't get that? You know, <laughs> it's not elective. We need ventilation. We need good indoor air quality, and it's um, it shouldn't be an elective thing. It's fine, and and I I like lead. It's fine if lead. Um, stays around as an elective thing for us as a proving ground, okay? Um, but there are some mandatory things that I think need to be captured and codified in the building code. And, um, and some of them um, have to do with carbon emissions and energy, and some of them have to do with temperature and comfort and um, supporting individual autonomy and controls. So I, I, I'm, I think I'm aligned with the idea. I, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea of something that's elective. I also think that ultimately Leeds market penetration has been small. You know, I don't think it's reached 5% market penetration. Yeah. And that, um, we human beings deserve better than just one out of 20 people getting the good buildings or something, you know. Yeah, um, 5%, it's a luxury good at that point, right? I don't think it's reached 5%. I don't think it's reached 5%. And um, anyway, so... We think about think about the automobile industry and how it went from zero percent to now it's a hundred percent or just about a hundred percent, right? Yeah. If if you were a, a professor at Wharton and you know you had your graduating class and every one of them submitted a business proposal where only five percent market saturation existed, mm -hmm. that was the upper limit, you'd all fail. Right. Totally. You know, you know and out with with great love and respect for lead um i think lead registrations peaked in 2010 that's 10 years ago and and i think we're struggling to to find where green buildings fit is it um you know is it lead is it passive house is it architecture 2030 we're struggling to find it and i think the right place 
for green buildings is, is, is in the building code. I think we need to yes. harmonize what, what we feel is an acceptable and important standard for health, um, safety. The building code has, you know, it really came out of fire safety. I mean, that's the foundation. I mean, also structural safety. We don't want them falling down. But fire safety was the number one driver. And I think we just need to add to that um, a, a um, consensus standard for energy and water and finishes. Um, and in the book, you know, you talked, Robert, about, um, I don't know what word you use, something about challenging your students. Or, um, in the book, we purposefully try to um, challenge readers with a focus on, um, on modesty, kind of on, um, I think historically, buildings and, and the energy code was all about adding to buildings, adding more insulation, adding more efficiency, yeah. adding, adding, adding. And we take the position that that's totally fine. And there's a complementary approach, which is kind of like sculpture, where you're taking away things that you don't need. Correct. And in the U.S., we, you know, our average house size is like, that's like 250 square meters or something. It's yeah. outrageous. It's, it's outrageous. McMansionville, right? <laughs> it's McMansion. I mean, yeah. um, and it's grown by over 50% in the last 40 years. It's outrageous and we, we, we don't need it. Yeah. And that, that size of a, that I'm using a home as an example, but it's the same for hotel room sizes. It's the same for offices. Um, so we, we take the position in the book that a building that is bigger than it needs to be uses more carbon and energy than it needs to, and, it, and it's more cost for the owner than it needs to be. Um, we take the same position with the window to wall ratio. I think architects, just went nuts with glazing. And, um, and glazing happens to be more construction cost per square meter than an insulated wall for some reason. But it looks sexy. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it wins awards. It wins architectural awards. So um, I think ASHRAE is totally right. ASHRAE has gone to 30% maximum window to wall ratio. Uh, is it ASHRAE or is it uh, IECC? I, I can't remember. One of them is now starting to put a limit on window to wall ratio. Yeah. And, and I advocate for even less. I think that window to wall ratio on an average basis should, should be 20% or less. And that you have plenty of good views, daylighting, everything you need. But you don't need to put glazing on stairwells. You know, uh, you don't need to put glazing the, the occupancy rate of a stairwell in yes, a multi-story right, building right. Is, is seconds per day. People don't spend time in stairwells. And architects have these massively glazed stairwells lit up at night, and it's unnecessary. It's so, architectural pornography, right? That's what it is. Well, I mean, it wins awards, but um, so... Um, so th this is an, another major theme running through the book is modesty um, and, and sculpting the sculpting buildings, taking things away that you just don't need, yeah. whether it's size, whether it's shape. There's a major, major section on building shape. We've, we've defined a term called shape efficiency, which is on a scale of zero to 100. And... Um, and a, a more efficient building shape uses less materials, less energy, and less construction cost per square meter of useful floor area. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's a kind of a theme, and it's a challenging theme. I mean, I, I throw these things out to architects and, and, and uh, 
developers and they, they struggle with them. So, Ian, I, took, I mean, you brought two points yeah. that we like to hash out here. One has to do with codes because both Adam and I agree with you that, you know, if, that in a free market world, which is what we operate in, uh, the competitive nature of the construction of the property development business is, is that you're going to get the lowest cost hmm. building that is in compliance with the code. So until we change code, we're always going to have the lowest compliant building, which doesn't serve humanity in the world and the word of sustainability or, or stewardship at all, right? It's about minimizing risk, not creating efficient buildings or buildings that support human health and wellness. So codes, we have to change. I want to hear your, your, your comments on that because how do we change codes when it's driven by such a low denominator or low ethos? And then the second one is architecture, which is really a cultural based phenomenon, right? Yeah. So how do we deal with cultures and architecture and how do we deal with the culture and codes? Because those are the problems the right there. Codes, well, I'll speak to the US, you know, I'm, I'm down in the US and we're, we're actually, there's a, there's a big shakeout happening with the International Codes Council um, where they, um, they, they've, they made a place at the table for cities to participate in the um, code, code development process. And every city in the country now has a sustainability officer. And these sustainability officers wanted a more efficient codes. And the International Codes Council, which also has um, strong representation with the National Association of Home Builders and uh, manufacturers weren't happy. And they, and they um, I think in the most re recent, you know, a few months ago, they kicked off all of the city sustainability officers from, and so, and this made the national news. So there is a tension. Yeah. The codes have been getting better. In 2015, they, in the U.S., they took a great jump, wonderful jump. And then 2018 cycle, it was tiny, you know. Um, so there, there's, there's a shakeout happening. There's a tension happening. I happen to think that the codes are the right place for for this to be hashed out. I think the market, the, the low market penetration of lead and of Passive House and Architecture 2030, all of them, it's, it's, it's not enough. And the, the one place that has good market penetration is codes. Co codes don't have 100% market penetration, right? Because people don't fully comply with the code. But they say that the codes have about, you know, 90% 90, 90 effectiveness. And so that's where I think is the right place. And, and we allow in the, uh, at least in New York State, but I think it's, I think it's, I think it's universal. The states are, um, local municipalities are allowed to pass energy codes that are more stringent, uh, but not less. And so New York City, my city, Ithaca, are, are doing just that. And uh, that's a good movement. I think, you know, if, if you have a state or a city that wants to go farther, all power to them. That's a good thing. Yeah, we should have that. Yeah. Yeah. You remember, Adam, when we had, uh, was it Saeed? Yeah. Our, uh, uh, I can't remember. Chairman anyway, of the Green Building Council in the UAE. Yeah. Yeah. And he, we had him on, what is it, two years ago or something like yeah, that? Anyways, he made a really great statement back then, which is coming true. And that is, is that any change that will occur within earth stewardship and the property development will come at a local level. It won't come at a federal level, uh, state or provincial up here in Canada, but it'll be the local municipalities driving. Yeah. And when he made that statement, I don't know about you, Adam. Like I, it was a, it was one of those epiphanies that, mm. you know, because it made sense that you're going to have local communities that uh, realize that the federal benchmark is inadequate. 
Well, that's just that's like Hanson, your... right? That's uh, California, New York are good examples of that. But you got okay. this, like. Do, do you have a province that's ahead of the others? In uh, yeah. yeah, Vancouver, British yeah, Columbia. Vancouver. Yeah. British Columbia has been basically mirroring, if not leading, what's happening in California. California. We, we, look, yeah. we look to California, you know. Um, yeah. Toronto has a green building standard and some different codes now. But the problem is building code is a government market trailing thing, right? It's always five, 10 years behind culture and what's going on. So the goal with LEED, which it looked promising at first, was to create a market-driven, virtue-based thing, right? So the market would pull the, the buildings in the right way. But it didn't, as you say, it didn't catch on. And since Leeds gone to version four, Jerry Udelson said they've got 74% reduction in business because it's becoming too difficult and costly now, right? It's difficult. So the, um, other, it's, the, the question is, if you can't, you can't wait for government to do it because they're always trailing. The market for whatever reason, hasn't created enough virtue through through being green. So there we're in this sort of no man's land of, we all like the idea of it, but no one wants to do it because there's money involved, right? <laughs> well, the position that we take in the book is that you don't have to necessarily spend more money. If you, um, if you have a building with a simpler shape, yeah. Load it up with character. I'm not wanting to take character away from the building. I'm yeah. wanting to take surface area away, but not <laughs> character. Yeah. So if you go with a more modest building shape, a more modest building area um, or size, you, I mean, you'll easily save what you need to save to do a, a modest window to wall ratio to to add some insulation, you go um, electric. I think ultimately we do need to stop using fossil fuels. So it's it's going to be most likely a heat pump. Right. You know, unless they develop biofuels or they talk about renewable um, natural gas or something. You know, but other than that, we're most likely talking heat pumps. So if you have an electrified building that's modest in shape and size and window to wall ratio, and it's not overlit, it's correctly lit per IES, you, you, you don't flood it with artificial lighting. Um, you're almost there. Then you, you've, you, you've saved. Today in the US, heat pumps prices are dropping below uh, boiler chiller systems. And yeah. so you end up with a building and you, you, you actually have, you, you have funds to spare and that you put in your renewables, either on site or, or remote. And you're, you're, at least on paper, you're net zero. You've promoted the purchase of renewable energy, which we want to do. And, um, you know, net zero becomes much easier than we thought it was going to be. And it doesn't, the envelope doesn't necessarily need to be any different than what we're doing today. It, it doesn't. It's a um, game of incentives though, right? So I agree with all that, but I think the way, if I was given the task to try and make that manifest in the real world, I would say to a big developer, if you can make this development net zero, I'll give you a 10 year break on taxes or something like that, right? Some incentive, because there need to be examples people can look physically go and say oh that's what it looks like it doesn't look like a three-headed monster it looks like a normal house i have one of them right <laughs> it, it does need to look exactly like a yeah. normal building and it is going to look like a normal building um we and and you were talking robert was talking about local initiatives we have our local ida industrial development authority they they give out money to attract business to town and we're a progressive little um, city. They call Ithaca a bumper stick. We have a bumper stick that says 15 square miles surrounded by reality. 
<laughs> we're a little progressive. Uh, we're a college Hold town. On. We've got Cornell University. Yeah. So the local IDA, IDA, Industrial Development Authority said, you know, we want to promote energy efficiency in buildings. So we will we'll give our usual tax break if you build a building. We'll give our usual tax break, and then we'll give an additional tax break if you build an energy efficient building. And it's been a smashing success. And it's exactly what you just said. Adam. Yeah. All it is, is a real estate tax break. Okay. It's win-win. The county gets new economic development. Developers come to town to build buildings and the developer gets to uh, get, gets economic incentives to build the building and a sweetener for energy efficiency. And then the county gets buildings that are right now, the benchmark right now is 80% less carbon emissions, 80% less than code. Wow. So they're typically all electric buildings and they've got a little solar. And um, so, and we're going to see more of that. Um, but I think what has been a failure has been what we were trying to do, to, to, you know, 20, 30 years ago, which was low cost, no cost, yeah. what they call low cost, no cost energy improvements. And so, you know, it's low cost, no cost. So what the results were kind of like zero, you know, they, you get what you pay for. And, we were, we were hoping that, you know, with screw in CFLs and a few yeah. things infiltration, but what we, we really need to swing big and, and, and we need to incentivize big. Solar energy took off in the US with a 30% federal tax credit. It took off, took yeah. off. And then when it took yeah. off, the prices plummeted. And that's a smart, government incentive, tax credit, they didn't, you know, um, we, we need that, we need that for heat pumps. And then on the other side, they've, we, we have a federal tax deduction. That's like nothing. It's the 179D US tax deduction. It's a dollar 80 per square foot. So that's um, 18 cents, or, I don't know, maybe more, 20 cents per square meter. It's like nothing. I mean, a developer would look at that and just say, well, it's a joke. Probably cost so, it more in accounting fees to get the money, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, that's, uh, what's interesting about all of this, because I've been studying this stuff for a long, long time. And um, we used to say that, you know, like on the residential side, let's just take, for example, that consumers would build these McMansions and then they would spend next to nothing, less than 5%, sometimes only 3% on the HVAC systems uh, to compensate for the bad indoor environments that the big lousy architecture and the big houses generated. And that, but that didn't change the consumer spending. It, all, it meant, all it meant was is that they had more money for what we defined as the poo and the goo machines. And the poo and the goo machines were the pets and cosmetic industries. Americans, including, well, let's just say America, including Canada and the United States, the continent of North America, consumers spend so much money on their pets and on cosmetics relative to what they would spend on their indoor environments. Yeah. And we still have that legacy existing in our culture today. And I think I like what the two of you are saying in terms of incentivizing uh, so that no longer the poo and the goo get the money, but rather it goes towards a more just cause. Well, which the, is more, you know, yeah. the consumer is all about finishes and views, finishes yeah. and views. And the construction industry has become somewhat commodified. Oh, yeah. um, and I mean, I think that I think that the building performance industry has done a favor to buildings by emphasizing aspects of quality. Um, the whole commissioning movement, to me, yeah. is just a part of quality control. Yeah. And that um, 
you know, in the US in the 1980s, we got our pants kicked because the Japanese were making better quality cars. So the US went back and studied quality and Ford, Chrysler, GM, you know, they make, they now make much better quality cars. Oh, yeah. And they thought I thought Deming was right after all, right? What's that? They thought Deming was right after yeah. all. Totally, totally. Deming did his thing in Japan and the U.S. went and learned from that. And we, we haven't yet turned to quality in construction, but we're starting to. Yeah. And, and so we came up with the whole commissioning thing. And um, I think building inspections are really important. And who does building inspections? Well, the high performance building standards um, like EPA Energy Star has a nice standard for multifamily buildings in the US and it requires inspections. And the state of New York, they've got incentives for high performance buildings, but it requires inspections. So these buildings that, good in, that get good inspections end up performing better. Uh, and it's wow, a, wow, I, what a concept. <laughs> I think it's a service to the whole industry to say, you know, you're, you're, you're spending your life savings on a building. It's worth spending a little bit on inspections, um, performance inspections of the HVAC. And now they're doing commissioning of envelope. Yeah. And every time um, we have a young guy, he's like 30, I don't know, 35 or something. And he just loves this stuff. And when he does inspections of envelopes, he finds missing insulation oh. everywhere because he's on site, open wall. They haven't yet closed the wall up. And he says, what's this? You, you know, the drawings say that the foundation is supposed to have some rigid and I don't see any. You're about to close it up. So good inspections, um, I think, are something that we need and that are, is, is starting to happen. Yeah, I mean, that's the game of consequences, right? That was my nickname on one job site. I'd come in and they'd be like, no, they'd go do that, go do that. And the guy, the supervisor called me, oh, consequences is here. Because I'd go around and say, no, that's not right. Undo that, fix that. And, yeah, because that's it ends up, a job. It, it ends up being more painful for them to yeah. have to redo something. Yeah. So when you bring consequences, you get action, right? But I think we're at this inflection point as you say there's people have moved on from green as a novelty and they sort of like the idea but it needs to be more there needs to be more consumer choice with it somehow right and there needs to be possibly some more enforcement or some incentive so i like the tax incentive as a way to do it and promote it as a as a virtue if you like but also something that you can buy because you know if you wake up in the morning and say I want an efficient green house, green built house. You haven't got a lot of choice unless you're going to hire an architect and do something from scratch. Where do you go for that? There's nowhere, right? I mean, um, it comes back to the issue of standards, you know, and, yeah. and I think there's a place for green building standards, right? whether it's yeah. LEED or, or HERS or Passive House. Um, they need to keep working on their branding and what the consumer is getting yeah. for that rating. Um, I kind of like the idea of, of, of rating systems. So the building comes with some sort of a plaque. I like the idea of performance ratings where over time, and lead, yeah. lead played around with this with some sort of a dynamic rating. Yeah, I see, yeah, it didn't sort of land. Um, so I, I think there's a place for, the, for those things. So that's consumer choice, okay? That is yeah. the consumer. And, and I mean, I, I think that's good for, as a, as a continued proving ground. Yeah. And I really like the codes dipping in periodically and taking the good stuff out and making it mandatory. You know, yeah. whether it's a ventilation level, um, whether it's an energy efficiency practice, whether it's a water conservation practice. Let them go in every once in a while and say, 
you know, um, this flow rate is, we've got good shower heads at this flow rate. We can go with it. It's mandatory. And it's, it's I mean, it's not only shower heads. It's also, we found uh, the bath diverters, bath diverters, um, they leak like hell. They're terrible. And so I, I think there needs to be a standard for leak prevention for bath diverters. Every hotel I go into, I lift up the little plunger there and there's, there's um, you know, several uh, in, in, met in metric units, liters per second um, of, of water leakage. So I, I, I really like the idea of proving ground for um, elective green building standards and then periodically the good stuff being pulled out and made mandatory. Um, yeah, and that, and I, like, I like the idea of local, local codes. Ultimately, um, I also want things into, in our national standards. The edifice complex will continue in just a moment. Can you find the drawing and supporting documents you need in less than a minute? Now you can with Echo. It's simple. Just type what you're looking for and press enter. Echo knows your building. Speak with a drawing specialist today. Ask about our special offer of painless onboarding plus six months free with Echo. Visit podcast.thedsoffer.com. That's podcast.thedsoffer.com. And now back to the show. What's your national building code in Canada? What, what, what's it called? We have a federal code and provincial codes and also municipal codes, right? Mm -hmm. So the and, NBC of Canada, right? National Building Code of Canada. And <clears throat> energy code? Yeah, so there's energy versions of it now, right? Mm -hmm. So which is... So we have the national building code, which is published in part with assistance of um, IRC, Institute for Research and Construction. But, the, and that actually serves as a sort of the, a guiding light, if you will. Then at the provincial level, like for example, in Vancouver, a little bit different climate than say in Manitoba. So they're allowed to adopt the National Building Code or edit parts of it that are more geo or geography specific. <laughs> And then I guess, Adam, it's been now probably 10 years, I guess, when they started to work on the National Energy Codes of Canada. And there's a rollout uh, over the next period of time. I don't remember what that period is. Um, yeah. You know, sort of a step code process where every few more years it gets a little bit more challenging and challenging or, or reduction in energy use, right? Do you so we are starting to see it. Do you reference ASHRAE standard 90 or, or 189? Well, it's certainly in the engineering community it is, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We it's, have our energy code has a compliance path right. that is based on ASHRAE standard right. 90. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, there I'm all, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm all for uh, energy or building codes referencing the ASHRAE energy standards. But in absence of referencing ASHRAE 55, which is the thermal comfort, thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy, or 62.1 and 62.2, which is the air quality and ventilation standards, you know, it just drives people to look at energy, 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 and then they ignore the most important element, which is the human, and which is the air quality, thermal comfort quality, lighting, or lighting courses in their sound, and all these other metrics. And so I... I think any code that ref doesn't reference the environmental standards while well, only referencing the uh, energy standards is misleading. There was an interesting uh, pendulum with uh, ventilation, with ventilation swinging yeah. way, way low, and then it's come back as people realize they had um, cranked it down too, too much. Well, it's a public yeah. health issue at this, at this point, right? Ventilation. Yeah. Well, huge, huge. You know, Although I'm, I'm still not clear myself if COVID is transported through ductwork. Have you guys? I'm trying to find research. So right now, there's very few actual case studies that have looked at the transmission 
of the virus through the ductwork, but there are cases. One of the most uh, telling uh, laboratory experiences when they took, um, I can't remember what kind of animals that they were, minks, and they had two chambers. So they had an upper chamber and a lower chamber uh, where the upper chamber had the virus and, and the lower chamber was the minks. And they connected the two chambers with a duct and the minks ultimately end up contracting the, the virus. So, so that, that says it can, can, if can. It's, if it's airborne, logically, you have to say it can be transmitted through duct work. It's about concentration levels, ultimately, right? Right. That's but there, was, also- there, was, there was two different um, manifestations. One yes. was uh, as droplets that fall within a f- meter or two. And yeah. the other is aerosols. Yeah. And I just haven't seen anything firm that said uh, they speculated that it's an aerosol, but nothing like totally concrete. But but the, the well, this is this is actually my ballywick. Like this is what I've been doing for the last 14 months, because I sit within a uh, uh, it's a global citizen scientist group, and we have everyone from epidemiologists to virologists to aerosol scientists to engineers. Oh lawyers, accountants, we got everybody, every profession represented. Anyways, uh, Lindsay Marr, Professor Lindsay Marr, just published a paper along with I think six or seven other of her academic colleagues talking about the history of the definition of an aerosol versus a droplet and where did the one to two meter distance come from. And the dogma that was created today that's adopted by many influential pandemic experts is based on fallacy. Like they went through the history going back to the 1800s, looking at the literature and the, and the scientists that published it and what was omitted uh. in the information. So I would encourage like, you know, like Ian and then, but anyways, listen to this podcast within the next time this gets published well, your, is your look at mink, that paper. The mink experiment, it just settles it. If, it, if two disconnected <laughs> chambers, if two chambers connected only with air. Yeah. Uh, transmitted it, then it's a done deal. Yeah, um, so one would think that, right? But, yeah, but you have, you <laughs> have, unfortunately, within the field of epidemiology, infectious disease, and public health officials, they have these blinders on, and they don't want to listen to this this data. There's hospitals where studies have been done in hospitals where they've found the uh, COVID nineteen signature in duct work in grills like the intake uh, uh, return air grills that can be like 40 meters away yeah. right well how did it get there no one got up on a freaking ladder and breathed in it you know like so for fortunately you know the the hvac systems the filtration systems in hospitals tend to be a little bit better than what we find in other buildings and they've, they've uh, got high, higher air change rates Better so right. Yeah. So you, so it's good to be skeptical about whether the virus is getting in, you know, pulled into the return air uh, and then distributed throughout the building because there's not a lot of conclusive evidence that occurs. There's evidence that occurred with the laboratory, but there was no filtration between yeah. the chambers, right? But so that's that's important to understand as well. That's not, to, that's not to say that we should ignore the possibility. The, the, the problem here is, even if you publish a paper that's very convincing and well-referenced and based in historical fact, people are tied into dogma, which is essentially a cult. So you right. might be asking someone who's based their whole career on something to change that idea. That ain't happening. <laughs> that is not going to happen, right? Because yeah. people like when you join a cult, the earth's going to end in next Sunday and the earth doesn't end. They just double down on something else, right? It's yeah. just... the, the reality is, is that most health professionals, again, you can go through yeah. the list of all of them. When they left university, the very day that they left university, they had the academic qualifications to solve the pandemic because the science they studied was based on fundamentals until they got a paycheck from a tribe that doesn't believe in the fundamentals. <laughs> That's exactly well, well, what's going on. You know, we've, we've, we've got uh, skeptics today that are doing a lot of damage, but um, I'm, I'm more talking about even anchored in science, what, what we know after a year, a year, yeah. a year and a bit. Um, 
and what we don't know. And um, I mean, we're, we're going to end up in a direction of more ventilation, almost for sure. Oh, how, do you, how do you perceive of yourself in Canada in terms of building science? You guys, are you proud of yourselves? Or do you think you're ahead of the game? <laughs> so, and you know, at one time, Canada was the darling in the, in the world of building science. And, you know, we had to uh, CMHC, which is Canada Hort uh, Home and Mortgage Corporation, Canada Mortgage and Home Housing Corporation. And then our Institute of Research and Construction. And we had lots of great scientists, lots of great researchers. We wrote tons of papers, published books that were used all over the world. If you look at the ethos of Passive House today, you know, it's, some of it's founded in the early science that occurred, you know, in the high performance buildings that we were doing back in the 70s. But then one of our changes in federal government, and Adam, you know who it was, he was an economist, came into power. And within, I think, his first two, year, two terms or first term, he slashed research dollars to our institutes. And at that point, we basically have been observers rather than leaders. Yeah, it's so interesting. So this also dates me. It was a loaded question. I asked it on purpose that way. So my perception of Canada is with the research that Jack Rousseau did at CHMC. Yep. And, um, you know, your, your um, CanMet Yep. resources your hot 2000 software i'm maybe i'm living in the past but so my <laughs> perception yeah i mean it also goes back to you know my having studied in canada what i tell people was when i went to high school outside new york city really good 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 public high school i was an a student a plus student I was almost top of my class. I went up to McGill and I was like a C student. And I said, what, what happened? <laughs> well, I went back to graduate school at Columbia. It was one of the best schools in the country, in the US. And I was an A student again. The only thing that happened in between was I went to Canada. And that was, um, you know, my, my experience and my exposure to Canadian academics at McGill was it was like three levels higher than in the U.S. And so I've got this old bias that just says that Canadian educational system, which is rooted in the English educational system, and we had Scottish professors, and, and they were tough as hell. And um, so I've, I've always thought very, very highly of Canadian building science. And I haven't been in touch with it for a few years. So if it's crashed, I wouldn't know about it. I'm not impressed. Yeah, and, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's not, I mean, some of the uh, researchers still exist. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, it's it's been really frustrating to say the least, but that, that is what it is, you know, that's yeah, our the, political systems and, and it's, it affected us for sure. It's the problem, right? With North America, I mean, Canada and America here is, I come from the UK where the cost of energy and water is way, way higher than it is here. And right? so it's, it's a much milder climate though. So you, you have much lower loads. Yeah, but we have to bring our energy in from countries we go to war with every 50 years, right? So <laughs> and they don't it makes really a difference. So. The problem, what I noticed here, I moved here 15 years ago. I see Canada as a whole generation behind the UK. I'm not saying that I'm a Brit, I'm a Canadian, right? But in the UK, energy is literally four or five times higher, yeah. right? So there's a consequence to that. It's what's represented in the building code and in the cost you pay. Water costs money, energy costs money. To me here, 15 years into being in Canada, Gas for my car still looks so cheap, it feels free. I don't even think about it. And everyone loses their mind here about the cost of it, right? It's, it's so much cheaper. And, <laughs> and we, we are paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Yes. So it's, yeah. You know, it's, um, and our, our natural gas is half the cost that it was 10 years ago. It's plummeted because of 
hydroelectric, right? So, you know, I was in, I'm in business here. I've got an M&E design firm. You go to someone and try and talk them into a heat recovery ventilator or energy recovery system. What's the payback? You do the math, it's like a century or something. You no, know, I'm, I'm an environmental advocate. I'm married to a wonderful woman who also cares a lot about the environment. Yeah. And we were heating with oil. And I, I said, let's put in a heat pump. And I'm begging her. She says, what's the payback? And I show her the paybacks, like 20, 30, 40 years. And she says, well, that's a lousy investment. And, and I, you know, I try and say, well, you know, the, pl- the, the planet is, is an important investment, even if it's not a good investment. Um, our energy costs, it's, it's a killer killer our energy costs are so low and um we can solve pollution problems energy problems overnight if we put the appropriate price on them yeah right the externalities are priced in the pollution is priced in but we won't do that because you can't get elected when you do that yeah so the the tax tax in this country is a bad word so they talk about price signals yeah we need to put a price signal (laughs) um um, this is the thing, it? right? So, this it turns out economics is actually an important social science, particularly the concept of a vertical demand curve. So, in the UK, every year, energy, uh, petrol, gas for cars goes up, smoking goes up, alcohol goes up a lot. Something like 80% of the cost of a gallon of gas in the UK is tax. Yeah. And the reason is it's a vertical demand curve. People cut back for a month or two, then it goes straight back to where it needs to be. That is, that's tax, that's money in the bank, right? So the the British government tax revenue that way to incentivize behavior. But there's this America and Canada is a big place, driving is a cultural phenomenon, right? And over here in Canada, when Canada, when the price of, gas went up a dollar a gallon. I literally, people were talking about it. I could hear them in my road talking about it and moaning about it, right? To me, that was like a third of the price I used to pay 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, so U- Europeans are far ahead, and they didn't used to be, you know, in the, in the early days of the energy crisis, it was the uh, U.S. and Canada who were yeah. uh, had good, good energy, uh, national energy appliance standards, um, fuel efficiency standards. And it feels like we've slipped behind. And well, uh, we have. When you look at countries like Denmark, who really are a leader in the world when it comes to environmental issues, sustainability issues. I mean, there's no other. I mean, there's a few countries that are like them, but they are certainly a leader in it. Um, I, I, Adam, we're getting we're getting close to the end of the interview, and I, you know, clearly with yeah. me and like a lot of our guests, we could keep going forever. <laughs> Because it's interesting discussions. Um, I do want to give one shout out, though, before we get into the final quick five questions. Yeah. So I really like this book, and here's why. STEM communication is an important subject, right? And it's illustrated. The key word in this book is illustrated. So here's two things I really like about this book, which is why I recommend it to people. And I'll put a link in the show notes if you can buy it. Engineers... Typically, people in technology are visual, in my experience. Not all, but mostly visual. So the illustrations are real value add in this book. And the other thing I like about the book is it gives you examples. It's like an applied book, right? This is what this looks like. This is what that looks like. This is how it works. This is how you do it. So from that point of view, as a book you can dip into and take a lesson from, it is a great book. And I really commend you for that. Thank you, Adam. And I have to, you know, I have to share the credit with Frank. Yeah. He uh, has spent his life trying to take concepts and make them visual. Yeah. And I think there's two things that happens. One is you see an illustration and so you, so you relate to it. I think there's something else that happens. I think that when people are, it's almost like a child reading a picture book. Yeah. When you see an image there's something that gets switched in your brain and your brain becomes more receptive to the right. Couldn't agree more with that. And 
So people pick up like that building construction illustrated. That must be the number one selling architecture book in the country. It's 40 years, 50 years old. And it, but it's people see the details and they say, I can relate to that. I can do that. Yes, I can understand and, that. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the magic of, of Frank's illustrations. Some of the illustrations in our book are art. They're not even um, green building illustrate. They're not even green building details. But he he has a way of just making you feel relaxed. He does, um, yeah. You know what's what's an urban infill? Well, an urban infill is a you know it's when you've got an, a a tooth missing in a row of buildings. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, he's. Um, he just made, you know, he just kind of sets the stage for you to be receptive yeah. to the information. And, and um, then we tried, we tried to plow new ground with the building shape and the, um, affordability issues. So we tried to, some people pick it up and they say, oh, it's, it's kind of too simple. It's an illustrated book. But ac actually, we try to load it up with tools. Yeah, you, you don't need to build a tiny house. You don't, but at least have a conversation with the building owner about how big you want the building to be. You know, you, uh, you don't that need to. My, that leads me to my quick fire question for you. Yeah, sure. So yeah, wind this down. You know, from my office here, um, I can stare at five brand new condominium projects that are going up and they're all glass. Yeah. Right. I live in a climate where it gets down to minus 40 degrees F or C, which is why they call it freaking cold. Right. And yet we have publications like this that illustrate, you know, how we, the vernacular architecture, what ought to be done. So Ian, why the disconnect? You know, why is it I can sit here in the year 2021, we've known for hundreds of years what works and what doesn't work in different climates, and yet we still have architects breaking common sense with building designs today. How do we, so let's just say that you're addressed, let's just say you're at, you know, I don't, well, let's go, to, let's go to Penn State University. They have an architectural engineering program. Let's say you get called up to do the commencement lecture to the architectural engineering students. What do you say about modern architecture and all of the flaws that exist in it and the words of advice for these students leaving, looking for jobs? Well, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I, I, I respect architects. They understand things about aesthetics that I don't. Um, at the same time, there's 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 physics that goes into a building design and, and thermal comfort. Um, and I think that they need to start understanding that if they glaze buildings the way they have been, um, they're going to pay the price. They're going to pay the price when when buildings get benchmarked. New York City now has a benchmarking law. Well, the benchmarking law has put major new buildings, including lead buildings, on the front page of the New York Times because they're performing so poorly. And I think that, I like what Adam is talking about, consequences. When your building, when your prize-winning building ends up on the front page of the New York Times because it's scoring a one on a scale of zero to 100 in performance, that's, that's going to be damaging to your career. So I think that the, the, whole, um, the whole thing of benchmarking and building uh, scoring, I think is good. Um, I also think that we, we need to, I, I went to my doctor um, two weeks ago. Beautiful, beautiful new building, downtown Ithaca. And I stepped into the room and you know, you wait for the doctor, right? So I'm waiting for the doctor and I'm seeing it's fully glazed, top to, to And they've already had to go and buy uh, shades because there's too much glazing. 
doctor comes into the building, I say, doc, what do you think about your building? He says, you know, I love our building, but I, if I were, could change one thing, the windows are too big. It's <laughs> uncomfortable. My patients are sitting here and they're freezing in the winter and in the summer, the sun comes in and they're boiling. Yeah. I think we need to somehow connect. My firm, because we do energy audits, we're going into the building, so we're hearing the people complaining about the thermal comfort, just as, as, as I think it sounds like you have, Robert. And the architects don't hear that. That, you know, what they see is they either won or didn't win a prize. That's it. <laughs> you know, you know we need to somehow, they need to get the feedback, um, thermal comfort feedback. They're like, they're like, architects are a bit like actors, needy actors who want an award. Oh, it's like me, please like me, please <laughs> like my work. I'm awesome, my mum told me I was great. <laughs> I mean, they're, they have difficult jobs, you know, I don't <laughs> envy them. They do. And, they do. and yet... Um, they do like a, They do like an award on their mum's refrigerator door, though. <laughs> they they like their awards. They like the splash, glossy, um, trade publication coverage, and we need to move them away. and And if it's a, if it's a mandate, if it's a building code that says maximum of thirty percent or twenty percent window to wall ratio, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. If it's a mandate, and or or somehow they need to be getting the feedback. They need to be. They need to have their reputation stuck. Um, there was a, a one Times Square building in New York City showed up on the front page of the New York Times because its performance was so bad. That's what needs to happen. But we're not there yet. They're still throwing glazing on everything from homes to high rises. Um, yeah, you want know to think about the Aqua Tower in Chicago and the Genie Gang Group or whatever they're called. You know, I was in Chicago during the construction of that building several times and watched it go up. And the whole time, I'm just shaking my head, going, this is a thermal disaster that they're making. No one says anything, right? I feel real sorry for the mechanical and structural engineers in that building because they must have been forced to do shit that they never wanted to do in the yeah. first place, right? Even before the building gets commissioned, it's already winning the gold, you know, the war. Just like Adam said, you know, warm hugs and patting everybody on the back and high fives until somebody shows up with a thermographic camera in the middle of February yeah. and says, this is how bad this building is, you know? So, maybe, we can, maybe we can ban architectural awards. I uh, Maybe, but fast, but fast forward, right? And the architectural firm that created the Aqua Tower is now doing another one with the same shit. It's like, come on, you guys. Well, you it's, know? it's, we're grateful to have people like you guys who don't, who are a little uninhibited, you know. Um, well, we don't care. Adam has no hair. My hair is great. Yeah. We're, we're at the end of our career. We don't care what we say because we've seen the crap, right? Yeah. None of our none of our revenues are based on what comes out of our mouth anymore, right? Oh, maybe I am I speaking to you, Adam? Are you yeah, no, that's true. Right? And I, I am <laughs> I am uncancelable. I do not give a flying hoot what people think about me. Not in the you know, slightest do I care. I'm talking to my wife about a retirement in a few years' time, and I also feel like. You know, I, I just don't have, I'm, I'm not looking for my next job. It's a great time to give to, back, to, to, to give back and to kick back, you know. Um, kick back is right, yeah. Like kick, kick some butt. Yeah. Just, just to wrap this up, I, I, we should wrap it up with some advice my one of my mentors gave me when I was struggling to manage a team of architects. He says, Adam, you've got to understand, architects are not technologists, they're artists. And they've never met an award they don't like the look of. They're all media whores. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it really made sense when he said yeah. that because I was treating them like they were technologists and engineers, and they're not. They're yeah. artists. Yeah. They create yeah. art, right? And, you know, their job is not easy. They come through yeah. architecture school. They, they've studied the art, and they've studied the the massing and the aesthetics and stuff and then they get thrown into real life and they're, they're needing to specify materials they've never heard of in their lives and it's very litigious at least in the u.s oh god yeah um so it's not an easy career and, and i i respect that and um just as the architect lets a structural engineer design the structure 
And I think that um, they they need to let engineers do the energy part and the and the and the thermal comfort and the envi envi indoor environmental quality. They're not commodities. Those are major things. A building's going to be there for 50 to 100 years. And you don't want people cold. And you don't want people hot. Um, so you know, it's funny. And when we were practicing, I retired, so I don't, I don't have a business anymore on the engineering side. But when, when we um, worked with society at large, we always said, we want you to come to us before you see an architect. And what you'll get from us is an indoor environmental quality specification based on a, on a flux BT per hour per square foot. You'll get those two pieces of information. Then you go to your architect and you say, okay, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Architect, here's the compliance I want with my indoor environment, lighting, sound, thermal, air quality. And here's the, my energy budget on a per square meter square foot. Now you do your job. Perfect. And you know, this, this is why the commissioning, the idea of commissioning and the idea of building requirements, you know, um, defining the building requirements up front. Yep. It's so powerful. Do I have time for one more anecdote? Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. So an architect comes to me and says, you know, I'd like you to make this building green. They show me their rendering. And I say, well, I think you've, you've, you've got... Um, too much glazing and there's things I think you can do. Oh, I cannot change that because I already have planning board approval for this facade. I said, oh, come on. And it, no, no, can't change. So I, you know, I kind of grumbled. And like a few months later, a different architect comes to me and says, listen, I, I want lead for this building. And I say, well, I think you've got, you know, too much glazing. He says, I can't change it. I already have planning board approval. They, it was exactly the same sentence. <laughs> and um, so this is, you know, what you're saying, Robert, about defining your specifications yeah. up front. Yeah. There needs to be a, um, you know, this whole business about integrated design involving the engineers and any energy professionals up front, yep. all within a context of quality. Quality is adherence to specifications. And if your specifications are good and solid and robust, um, you're more likely going to get the building that you want. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a culture that exists in many parts of the world, and that is, is that the architectural, or sorry, the mechanical and electrical engineers, and to some degree structural engineers as well, are there to uh, resolve the problems created by the architectural design. You know, they're there to fix shit, right? As opposed to be preemptive or proactive, you know, we react to the designs that were given, and and that's just wrong. I mean, we're the as, and you made the point, right? I mean, these buildings that last 100, 150, 200 years, whatever it is, and we strap the owners and we strap society with the operating costs, the maintenance costs, what we did to the earth to make the building, and you know, and it's just it's all bullshit, right? And the and the discomfort, and the dis yeah. I, I have measured the temperature profile in a building that has full height glazing, and you're talking about um. You're talking about six degrees Celsius between the ceiling and the floor. Yeah, it's that's a perceptible. Right? Yeah. And you have a yeah. desk near that window. Your feet are freezing. Yeah. Um, so and and you've got a convection currents and everything. It's a mess. Um, mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we're still unfortunately kind of just learning this stuff, and it the information needs to get get to the architects. Um, and, and engineers need to be a little more empowered themselves. They need to, uh, and, and they need to communicate better. They yep. need to be able to stand up and say, you know, I, you're creating a big problem for yourself. Um, well, I, you know what I found, you know what I found effective in was when we would go into design charrettes and I would let the standards speak for me. I would just say simply, we've done an analysis on Asher 55 and you're non-compliant. Yeah. 
Now the ball's in your court. What do you want to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and when the owners, yeah, when the owner's in the room with the architect and the owner looks at the architect and says, what do you mean I'm going to be non-compliant with Astri 55 or 62.1 or whatever. Right. And, and they, you know, and it's an awkward dialogue because the architects and, you know, I mean, they're sitting there with the owner and they're, and they've been paid X thousands of dollars to get the design to that stage and it's non-compliant. And now the owner's going, I got to spend more money to make the building compliant. So I, you know, towards the end of my career, I didn't say anything. I just let the standards speak yeah. for themselves. It's a, it's a good, good approach. It's a good approach. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I take my hat off to you guys. It's good. It's good that you're, you're, you're presenting this in this way. It's good. It's unusual. The only way to change this is through edu is through communication, STEM and engineering communication. As you say, we've got to have a bigger voice and we've got to change hearts and minds here, right? Yeah. Well, you all you did is make me miss Canada like mad. <laughs> <laughs> the edifice complex will continue in just a moment. Adam, it's time to thank some people who are on our side. Blue Rhythm Commissioning Software. Blue Rhythm is the commissioning software I've been looking for. Most projects I consult on suffer from poor information and document management. Frankly, it's just chaos out there. Blue Rhythm removes this chaos. It is a secure, always available cloud solution designed to work on any computer, tablet, or smartphone. Their Android and iOS apps allow seamless transition between online and offline work. But what I like most about Blue Rhythm is their painless and fast onboarding process. That team will bring all your existing forms and checklists into Blue Rhythm for you, or you can use or adapt their pre-built, pre-functional and functional performance test sheet templates. But it's more than that. It enables collaboration, automation, and easy planning and project management for all your projects. Blue Rhythm provides amazing support from a team that really understands your industry. To find out more, go to bluerhythm.com or call country code plus one, six one two, 460-8305. Also, you can hear from Blue Rhythm President Andy Martin on episode 26 of the Edifice Complex podcast. Robert, Robert, are we there yet? I'm bored. <laughs> Adam, well, it's hard to believe, but the future has finally arrived in Canada. How's that then? Well, smart remote building and equipment management is now available from Sensor Suite. Go on. Sensor Suite, yep, they're an innovator of smart building technology. We like them. They can monitor, control, and optimize anything in your building, saving you time and energy. You mean Sensor Suite are moving Canadian buildings into the 21st century? Yeah, I know, another hard thing to believe, but they're doing it and they're saving owners money with efficiency gains. Okay, I'm in. How do I find out more? Gotta go to sensorsuite.com or call 1 855 773 6767. And also check out the July 2020 episode of the NFS Complex podcast and listen to Sensor Suite CEO Glenn Spry. And now back to the show. So, Ian Shapiro, great to have him on. Um, the guy, you know, has obviously, you start your career with Carrier and you worked there for six years, you learn stuff, right? And then the guy gets into the engineering business and then he hooks up with one of the most well-known architectural illustrators on the planet. The guy, the guy carries a big stick. He made some good, I like this. He made a couple statements. Yeah. You need to swing big. That was yeah. one of the you know that that was I love that because that is one of the main criticisms when you're around a big project meeting table. The architects tend to dominate. And they make promises on behalf of the engineers. You look at the engineer, and you know that like has not been involved <laughs> in that decision at all, right? Engineers need to be more assertive. Like Peter Rumsey, get passionate and like advocate for what they want, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. That's, a, that's a good point. It's on engineers and the energy experts and consultants to be more assertive and sell it on the benefits, sell it on the science to use a catchphrase that's popular nowadays yeah you know we i mean it happens over and over and over again it happens in our podcast it happens in colleagues of ours that have podcasts it happens at conferences where the building codes come up over and over and over again as being one of the roadblocks to, to achieving what we're looking for you know from a earth stewardship sustainability 
conservation improvements, you know, building codes. I don't know, you know, like I just, I mean, I, I try to be as optimistic as I can in my life, you know, but when it comes to building codes, it's like they're, the committees are populated by a voice that is just so resistant to it's, change. It's a, it's, the system is rotten to the core because <clears throat> the lobbying and the corporate capture involved around building codes, right? So, you know, you want to say, let's just say there was a building code committee that really wanted to move the needle. Yeah. The minute they started talking like that, the lobbying and the money would descend on them, right? Why are you upset in this? You're going to increase construction costs, blah, 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 blah. You know, and it becomes a, you want to study and you wind up with a four-hump camel every time, right? I, 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 I don't. I think that is such a busted, stuck method. We have to, it has to be market-led change. My big idea was, and I can't get anyone to buy into this because I'm a crazy person, is massive open source data. What I mean by that is every, every property is on an open source database. Just, it just says property at this address, X thousand square meters, energy use, blah, blah, per square meter. So many dollars per square meter. So every year, the energy cost, the water cost, and the gas cost are pumped in, and it pumps out a metric per square foot or square meter. Yeah. And it's just yeah. there, and it's a name and shame thing, right? And hopefully, it would become a way to say, right, we're going to be better than the national average of this type of building or this type of residence, right? Yeah. Well, you and Ian were talking about uh, career consequences. Yeah. And I, and I love that idea. You know, there's not enough career consequences within the design community that, you know, when you, that a bad building hangs around your neck like kryptonite, you know, <laughs> and sure it. You know, you're taking capital resources, earth resources, you're strapping a system with penalties for the life of the building. There should be a shame associated with that, not an award. So I, I, I like that idea. You know, if you think about it right now, I mean, people listening to this podcast and whatever you listen to, we're in, a, we're in a worldwide pandemic, right? COVID-19. In many ways, when you look around the world, uh, Canada, the United States, the UK, our COVID mitigation strategies are just an indication of our building codes, you know? Yeah. And so when you think about countries that have like Vietnam, New Zealand, I'm not saying that their COVID strategies represent their building programs because their building programs are many, especially less than ours. They're less than ours, right? But they're, their approach was, you know, this is non-negotiable. Yeah. You know, we have, we recognize what COVID is all about because it represents other pathogens that have come through the world. And we recognize that the strategy is this and it works, right? And so they implement and enforce. And today they're actually sitting well within, you know, the rest of the world where we're in Canada. We're in miserable shape. The UK is in miserable, miserable shape. The US is in miserable shape because we can't get the status quo moved off this minimum requirement shit, and that's got to stop. You know, the, the one good thing that might come out of this pandemic is the refocus on ventilation as a public health driver in building design. Yeah. Right? Because it's always, you know, plumbing, sewage, all that stuff is natural public health issues, right? And there's well-established science around that. But ventilation's always been that sort of like one that's always been a bit floating around and people play with it. And it's wound up in the energy court rather than the public health court, right? Yeah. It needs to move firmly back to the public health court, yeah. in my opinion. Because, you know, it wound up in the energy court due to the energy crisis, right, in the late 70s. And that's the wrong home for it. Yeah, I, to I totally agree with that. Um, this thing about you know architects i think you said this you know or ian talked about you know the awards we only care about whether we win or lose an award it's like mummy do you love me now i've got another award mummy love me more 
<laughs> you know, and I, and I, you know, it's funny because, you know, my niece uh, has graduated from a couple of architectural programs, one in New York and, and yeah. has done, you know, and, and is facing the challenges that young architects face today. And, you know, I think the young architects today see uh, the legacy of their mentors and there's a tension between what their peers are creating, you know, in terms of environmental issues, energy issues, indoor environmental quality issues, and the legacy of the mentors that they look up to, you know, and they like engineers and everybody else have to make a decision, you know, do if, if we really want to eat, do we want to rock the boat? You know what, there's that, knowing what I know now about what architects earn, it is an industry that's really skewed to a top one or two percent and the rest earn absolute terrible money. The average salary for an architect is so low, it's embarrassing. So in yeah. terms of a return on investment for a four year degree plus doing art, you know, doing your, tri your articles to get, it's an eight year journey to earn way below unless you're a rock star in the end, right? Yeah. It's nuts. Why anyone would do that? I mean, it's a vocation, I guess, right? You do it because you're an artist and you want to do it. But, you know, there's not a lot of incentive to be great, do good, because uh, you don't earn well, right? You've got to want it bad and you've got to hopefully be a Norman Foster, right? Yeah, I uh, agree. I don't want to. I don't want to let our uh, summer here drop by without mentioning something that I thought was really interesting in Ian's career. And this is for the students out there that are listening to our podcast and the parents too. Yeah. Um, he sent out over three hundred resumes before he got one reply, which was from Carrier. Three hundred. Yeah. You know, so, so if you're a student and you're has struggling, particularly this time because of COVID um you know your challenges aren't that much different than ian's when he graduated and to send out have to send out 300 letters looking for a job one company replies and it was because of what he had studied in school one class one took one class in refrigeration and that's what got him the job at carrier that's that's how i wound up doing what i doing i did not because i wanted to it's just what i wound up with is the only job i could get in uh in the early 80s recession right so, yes. you know, that, that's fate at work, but you're right. I don't think the challenges are any different now. You have just got to slug it. Just because you've got a four-year degree don't mean anything. You've still got to go out, sell yourself, get a job, and learn your craft, right? And I don't think that's changed in decades. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you've got to do it. There's no job waiting for you at the end of that degree you know when you've got your gown on and your mum's crying that's awesome enjoy it but the next day stand out resumes man get going you have to hustle or be connected yeah. and all of the above you know i mean i remember my dad saying you know it's not what you know it's who you know yeah. and part of getting uh getting the jobs or, or getting the mentors that you're looking for is developing those social networks well as soon as you enter any educational school you got to be thinking yeah at the end of the game who do i know how can i help them get what they want so they'll help me get what i want that's an old zig ziglar philosophy you know yeah. you're helping out people get what they want they'll help you get what you want and i found that to be mostly true in my career any students who are listening now in your summer breaks get a job Try and get an internship, get a job, anything in the industry where you want to be, because those connections you make are going to pay dividends when you come yeah. to my job. And if you're lucky enough where you can work for free, like just, just say for whatever your uh, yeah. world yeah. exists, that your mom and dad or whoever is responsible for you, if they can, you know, make it easy for you to stay at home with a low cost. I mean, I remember my dad saying to me, again, like I just this young snot nosed, uh, you know, teenager with a bad attitude, you know, offer your labor services because you've got no brain. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, that you You're were born and no brain. <laughs> yeah, right. But if you can get some experience in the pen, you know, eventually they'll see that you'll work hard, they'll might pay you. And well, and that of course happened anyway. But you know what? I mean, I would say like anybody today, just like you just said, like you need to get that experience and you need to develop those contacts. And you know what? 
there might not be money there for you. And yeah. the value yeah. will be in you demonstrating A, that you have a work ethic, B, that you got a good brain on your head, and C, if you know how to network and develop those soft skills, then maybe that's the value that you get out of that job where you're working for free has money value that will, you know, yeah. exceeding your expectation. Absolutely. I, I got all my kids to do um, intern work during their summer holidays. You know, there's no, no vacations here. You've got to go to work. And they did. And it really helped when it yeah. came because they could... If you've got a couple of intern positions while you were going through university, when you send that resume out, you've got your degree and some work experience. That sets you immediately in another level of pile of resumes, right? Yeah. Hey, Adam, here's a question for you. Out of all the resumes that you've looked at over your entire career, did any one of those resumes talk about how much they earned? Never. <laughs> Not, so one. Not, Not one. Not one. So the best resumes are, here they are. It's one page. If you have to make me turn a page, you are not getting a job off me. Two, tell me what you've done, not what you can do, what you think yeah. you can do. I want to know what you've actually done. This is why if you've got intern experience, I'm reading that. Yeah. I assume you've got a degree and you've come out good. Don't, I'm not even, that's just not a factor in my decision. I'm assuming that's there. That's a prerequisite, right? So, you know, tell me what you can do. Tell me you need to communicate in that page that you can work hard and not be a total emotional time suck on me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But I don't think universities and colleges do a good job in communicating this to people, right? They don't put kids out with the skills, the life skills necessary. Yeah. They need someone like you or me to come in and, do you ever used to watch that show Scrubs? And then there was like Dr. Perry Cox who used to like manage the interns. Every day the new interns came in, he used to give them a speech as how, how you will kill someone in the first year because you know nothing. <laughs> but yeah. that was a real life thing. They need someone like you or me to come in and say, look, this is all good. I'm assuming you're going to pass and you're going to get this degree. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about what you need to do to be successful when you leave this place, that's what you need to talk about, right? Yeah. This is how you should do a resume. This is how you should try and get work. It's how you should present yourself. Turn up on time. You know, don't look at your phone. Not right there. Turn up on time. You know what? I would ignore, uh, at least in the beginning, a lot of character faults in a yeah. new grad or new hire. If they showed up, on time or before yeah. on time every day consistently if i knew i could count on them yeah in most cases i could i could train out of them the other issues you know yeah. unless there was a character flaw that i just couldn't yeah, resolve just turn but up you know on what? time and bring it to me right just bring totally. me back to you yeah. totally. you yeah. know what i made i made sports teams not because of my skill level because i sucked as an athlete you yeah. know I couldn't play hockey. I couldn't play football. Why did I make the teams? Because I didn't know when to quit. Huh? You know, when practice started at X hours, I was there X last 30 minutes. I huh? was there early. My skates were on. My uniform was on. And when they said, Bean, get on the field or get on the rink, I gave it my all until huh? I puked. Not because I had any finesse or anything like that, huh? because I showed up. Yeah. Huh? That's exactly right, man. That is exactly right. And that needs to somehow get into some form of college curriculum at the end where you have the, the, you, have the you will kill someone in your first year as a doctor talk, talk right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's well, old and cantankerous. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned this before about, you know, coddling kids, oh. you know, and making them feel good. And all that kinds of stuff. I mean, there's, there's some, you know, there's a there's a lot of value in developing somebody's confidence and self-esteem. I get all that kind of stuff, right? But if you graduate from a college or a university or a technical program, if I've got to work on your self-esteem, oh, I'm dude, out. I'm out at that point. That is a hard no for me. Yeah, we're not a <laughs> we're not a psychology service, or you know, we're not here to make you feel good about yourself. It's a business. And that's the hard realities of life as soon as you get out, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the fundamental thing when interviewed me is, is what are you going to do for me, not what am I going to do for you, right? 
Yeah. You know, but that's the dynamic that's not made clear. That hard reality needs to be made clear. Yeah. yeah. And, and you don't realize, you know, you don't realize that until, I mean, I was, and you basically, we were both to some degree unemployable because of yeah, our, oh, yeah. totally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, for those that, um, own their own businesses. You know, there's a little bit different personal personality yeah. trait than those that work for other people. Um, we're looking for people who, you know, will take risks, calculated risks, show up, work hard, continually learning. Yeah. You know, if I don't, if I never saw somebody who was always learning all the time, I they just had no room in our bench. <laughs> You know, it's like skill development. There's no different than a professional athlete. Like, so like, you know, again, for the kids listening to the, to our podcast here, right. You know, if you're a big sports fan, right. Whatever, but take a, take a sport, soccer, lacrosse, basketball, hockey, whatever. Right. Every one of those professional athletes are doing development all the time. Always, always, always. Right. That's what makes them professionals. And then when they get hurt, they get, they, you know, they don't go cry into mom and dad right? They take care of business, right? And that's what people are looking for today. You know, you need to be able to step up, suck it up, put on your big boy panties and big girl underwear. Yeah. Bring it and add value. Man. And bring it and, and yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? yeah. well, anyway, so on that note, we should over. probably wrap up. <laughs> Oh, God. I got fired up today. Thank Ian, yeah. anyways, we want to thank him for coming on because another great, another great guest. Yeah, no, that was good. I enjoyed that. And I love that book. I'll put notes in for people listening. There'll be notes in the show notes. You can link on it and go straight to the Amazon site and get the book. Yeah. Excellent book. Two, two great people right there, man. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go, man. Take care. See you in the next one. Right. Cheers. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. See you next time.